You're listening to the Fighting Irish Faithful Show on Dos Leprechauns Media, sponsored by Dos Leprechauns Media, selling out to Dos Leprechauns Media, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Doesn't matter. We don't care. We got 10,000 followers now on Dos Leprechauns on Facebook right now. So that was a milestone. Uh, So, uh, Jason, I'll be waiting for that check in the mail. (laughs) Yeah, right. Uh, Thank you for joining the Fighting Irish Faithful Show. And uh, yeah, happy to make uh make i'm happy that i'm part of your day your work commute uh and for the people who are going to join us tonight i see adam i see kevin and apparently a cat just jumped into my lap and scratched my leg so uh welcome to the cat here i'm gonna podcast this is actually a first hello cat podcasting with me all right totally off script um but i do have some information that is actually written down here uh, but first, scotch and spreadsheets. Y'all know the the drill here. And if you don't, welcome. And you're new. Uh, but we went to the old trusty, the twenty dollar very large bottle from Costco of blended Scotch whiskey. Uh, and today was probably the first time I had a swig of it, and I was like, yeah, this is not good. But <laughs> you can't be the price for what we do. And I'd have to say this has powered most of the shows. Um, I don't actually have a written log of uh, what whiskey we were drinking, so um, maybe I should start doing that. But anyway, welcome to the show, uh, Fighting Irish Faithful show. Tonight, we're going to talk, oh, last week, if you missed the show, we talked strictly about quarterbacks, specifically Sam Hartman, and did a comparison to him to what national champion quarterbacks do, and even did some comparison of how he does in tough games versus the likes of Jimmy Clausen, Brady Quinn, and Stenson Bennett. Uh, So if you missed that, go back to the other episode. That should be just before this one in your queue, uh, in your smartphone. So uh, yeah, oh, we got people jumping on here. This is great. Um, But first and foremost, before we do anything else, today was the Assumption of Mary, and since Notre Dame is Our Lady, the Mother of Jesus, if you didn't go to Mass today my responsibility to tell you to get right with the Lord, okay? I don't care if you're not Catholic, you should go to Mass anyway, all right? Because if you're listening to this, you're most likely a Notre Dame fan, and what would Notre Dame be without the Mother of Christ? So, all right, enough with my preaching there, all right? Um, and then before we get to our people here, one other thing before I forget, and the uh, scotch takes over my brain is uh, the toast of the night. Uh, It's going to go out to uh, the eldest brother in uh, the Fighting Irish Faithful uh, family, Uh, my eldest brother and Red Snapper's eldest brother. Um, There's a milestone going on in his life right now, I should say. So we're going to just give him the toast. We'll be very vague and generic there. But the toast is to uh, eldest brother Irish Faithful, who is not on Twitter. But maybe if we all pester him that'll happen all right let's get to some people here uh i'm gonna see i saw adam jump on first i think uh so we'll invite adam to speak and uh, he can talk about literally any topic under the sun regarding notre dame football um but we are going to talk about receivers running backs and defensive production available to the team uh that we have going into 2023 so adam bat signal sent out unless you are falling asleep and you cannot speak. but And if that's the case, that's fine. Um, we'll just move on to the next person. All right, Adam, you lost your spot. That's fine. We'll go to Kevin. At Davis 0560. Welcome back, Kevin Davis, if you wish to speak and join us. If not, we'll just save defense for the end, because I actually put that in last in my, in my list here. That was not done intentionally. Um, okay, so one of the, oh, there's Kevin. I see you coming on here. Welcome back, Kevin. Hello, I'll just call, say, uh, just tap in, just say what's up and say, hey. Hey. I want to hear what you guys say about these uh, receivers and this defense. I want to see what the stats say, see what the, what the spreadsheet say about this. Yeah, the, um, you know, a lot of it is, is a breakdown of 
what uh, what's left in the cupboard per se. Or, you know, what, who departed, who's left, and who are the notable departures. Um, since you're the defensive uh, secretary of defense of the podcast, you know, I mean, clearly the um, the big loss uh, per se is Foskey, right? Uh, the first Notre Dame player drafted into the NFL this season. Um, you know, he had. 23 solo tackles, 22 assisted tackles, but the biggest were his 14 tackles for loss and his 11 uh, sacks. So um, huge, huge impact, um, huge driving force uh, of our defense. And of the notable uh, returners, he makes up about half of the sacks and tackles for loss, respectively, of the notable returning uh, men. So that that's kind of that's a huge hole that we're going to have to fill. Um, so we'll see if some of these younger guys who, you know, especially on the D line and kind of the on the edge outside linebacker kind of positions, what they can do. It seemed like they're big on Jean Baptiste. Um, seemed like they think he's going to try to bridge that gap, but we'll we'll see. Um, I'm not. I mean, he hasn't played much, so I don't. Yes. And and you're referring to our uh, big transfer from Ohio State. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting. So, so we get Jean Baptiste, but then we we give. It's like a trade in in you know the NFL or something. We give them Lorenzo Styles, who now is a safety apparently. Or cornerback, really? I don't know. Yeah, he's playing. He's playing DB. So I don't know what that means, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's it, what he thinks is his best uh, opportunity to play. Um, I didn't really go back and look at the history of Styles. It's like, okay, you left. Peace be with you. Um, you know, it is what it is. So. Yeah. So, but yeah, Do that's. You know who- do you know who's second behind Foskey when it comes to sacks and tackles for loss? So as far as based off, so tackles for loss, if I just look at um, individual uh, contributions, second behind Foskey was, per my spreadsheet here, is J.D. Bertrand. Now I can verify that. Uh, let's see here. So j- tackles for loss, yes, was Bertrand had eight and a half right behind Foskey's 14. As far as sacks go, it was not Bertrand. It's another individual. Take another wild guess. Oh, it, I'll give you a hint. He had a key. Had had a, a punt block against Marisol, right? No, it's Bethello. Okay. Bethello had four and a half sacks, so he is second on the list as far as. Uh, um, you know, impacting the team and helping us in that regard. So, well, we got to get better pressure up front, Dan. That just that doesn't say a lot yeah. up front. It yeah, just... I'll be very honest with you. the The two areas that were of biggest concern. Number one was the D line, just because you know you lose um, Amiola's, uh, both of them are gone, um, and then you got Foskey, who was clearly was a presence, um, just based off of production. Um, and he can pretty much play wherever, you know, and, and do great at it. Um, so, so we really need to, to plug up the middle, um, you know, cause no good team is successful without having good men up front. The next piece I would say after D line is actually safety, because when I go through the stats and I'm looking at, okay, who made valuable contributions from anything from interceptions to tackles, tackles for loss, et cetera, sacks. Um, no safeties hop up there, and the, the only one that shows up would have been a notable departure in Brandon Joseph. But let's just let's face it. Brandon Joseph was not the biggest contributor in the uh, tackle department. He had 15 solo tackles and 15 assists. Now, he did have one uh, fumble and one... Um, interception so so that is good too um, but after that then you start looking at okay who's returning in the safety de- department no one really jumps off the page um, so it'll be very interesting to see um, you know who we're going to put back there at one of the most key positions on the defense and who has to be fast yeah, I, I would like to say that I feel like Brandon Joseph was a disappointment, but that's just me. Yeah, I kind of honestly, I thought he would do more 
Um, and I don't know if it's the transition from Northwestern Notre Dame or from whoever the DB coach was over at Northwestern under Fitzgerald, uh, going over to the Al Golden system, you know, uh, I would like more. Now, what I also will say is he had to fill some big holes from the previous, uh, you know, resident back there in Kyle Hamilton. Um, And if I even go farther back, I think of, you know, great safeties like Julian Love or Harrison Smith or, you know, pick pick your pick your favorite safety back there. You know, Um, I think let me say this. Whoever is fighting for the starting safety job, um, it's going to be earned because I think the the slate is pretty clean back there. Unless they're going to move one of these other people, um, you know, to the back um, who used to be playing uh, corner, for example. I don't know. Well, they talked about this, they talked about this new Aztec formation where they're going to have three safeties on the field. So we'll see. We'll see how this goes. I don't know. I don't. I mean, I guess if I guess if the opponent, it makes sense, you know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The the one guy, the one recruit who I think could have a chance uh, to do well and make con- contributions. Now, do I want him necessarily to be the starter? Not necessarily. But um, Ben Minich, uh, who yep. actually was recruited in as an athlete, and now now our our depth chart here at uh, FightingIrish.com is saying that. He's now listed as a safety. Um, so I think I think that is uh, of all our of all our recruits, um, you know, he's the only one that that falls into that safety safety bucket. After that, it's someone like a Christian Gray or a Micah Bell um, who is listed as a cornerback. And maybe they're just going to transition. I don't know. Yeah, I might I might be wrong. But I think Minich is he's nursing an injury. OK, or I might be. Wrong. I think he might be. I don't think it's anything major, but I think he has it. I think they're they're high on him. He just nursing the injury, I okay. think, or something. Okay. Yeah, and I'll and I'll be the first to admit I haven't I haven't uh, QC'd my list here against the uh, you know who's in the infirmary, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, which is <laughs> which maybe is a byproduct of how close we are to the beginning of the season because it's less than two weeks away. <laughs> which doesn't even feel what what now, i will say this the doc it was very impressive i think it was yesterday we're, we're sitting around having dinner right and she says hey uh do you want to have you know so and so over for the uh the notre dame game and i was just like this is excellent you're you're already like getting ready to like host people over here for for the first home game of the year like that would be fantastic so um of course i said yeah that would be fine um and they were very pro Notre Dame people, which is good too. You know, it's not just some random people and, you know, the, the people are going to go off in the other room and play bunco or something. Well, you know, I drink scotch and beer and eat nachos and yell at the television. You know, that, that is not the case. So, um, these are legit fans, um, that will probably be coming over. So, well, the least, the, the idea has been synthesized. And if anyone is, you know, in the, southern indianapolis area and wants to stop by by all means just hit me up on twitter and i'll send you my address so. <laughs> all right well kevin anything else on on players or uh any last thoughts before we move on to the, to our other people here we want to make sure we get everyone in yeah i'm just excited man i'm okay with being preseason 13 also so i'm okay with that oh, yeah. Are you baiting me when you do that? Is, is that like red meat you just threw at me when you said that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, or maybe you're like, oh, wait, yes, that's right. This is this host of this podcast. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, Kevin. That, that's fine. I'm not going to lambast you here. But um, number 13, sure, I guess that's cool. You know, lucky 13. Not that I'm that superstitious about it. Um, but do I personally really care? Not really. Um you know, 2012, we started unranked um, that same year in 2012. USC was ranked first. Um, we know what happened to them that season. Um, you know, for me, like the preseasons, you know, it's just it's just a bunch of stuff. And uh, to me, it just feels like smoke. And I guess it's kind of fine. And, you know, you got all these, you know, people who have access and writers. But it's like, how can how can someone who's like, 
you know, an AP writer in Georgia or LA or New York or South Bend or wherever really make a, a unbiased assessment of all the other, you know, teams in college football to really come up with an accurate top 25. Um, you know, I guess if you're, if you're, if you did what I do, which is look at, okay, who left, who made valuable contributions? Like for example, Estime contributed 11 rushing touchdowns to our total 25 last year, right? So, hmm, they still have that guy coming back. So that's part of the the ether there that'll make Notre Dame's rushing successful, for example, right? You would have to do that analysis for so many teams. And I just quite frankly, don't believe that you know, these people are doing this in any sort of mathematical, statistical way. It's just kind of knee jerk reaction, divining rods and, you know, crystals that they're coming up with how they're putting these things together, or they're getting paid in bank accounts. And it's like the NIL. I don't know, right? You know, there's, there's, you know, this is my tinfoil hat part of the podcast, but um, it's fine. Like, it's fun. Like, I can I can find the fun I guess in in the rankings. Do I put stock in it? No. Do do most people take stock of it? I've gotten shit for that on Twitter where people are like, "Well, geez, it's just pre-ranking. No one's taking it really serious." Like, eh, I guess, but then like that didn't stop Notre Dame from blasting it all over the you know and you know <laughs> sixteen by nine aspect ratio font. You know, it just says Notre Dame number thirteen preseason. So, yeah. um. I don't take any stock in it either. I just only reason I said I'm okay with 13 because I feel like it takes a little pressure off, right? It's, it's like 13. Okay, we're not super high ranked. We're like if we don't have a good season, it's we're like middle of the black. pack, you know? Right, yeah. So it's not like it's like we're not ranked one. It's like we have these super high expectations. And like so, I'm okay. Like I'm just okay with preseason 13. I'm, yeah, it doesn't bother that much. Yeah, I mean, and I saw something else about some of, you know, Notre Dame's players and how, like, I I think it was ESPN or someone who, like, ranked every single player. Well, not every single player, but, like, the top 100 players in college football. And, unfortunately, Caleb Williams was at the top, but it's like, okay, it's the Heisman Trophy winner. What do you expect, right? And it's USC and da-da-da-da. Okay, and then... um, um. They put I, I I scrolled down because I wanted to know where they put Sam Hartman. I, they put him at twenty five, so I'm like, okay, you know. But um, you know, quarterbacks are only as good as their receivers, and receivers are only really as good as their quarterbacks. So you know, that must be a symbiotic relationship. And you yeah. don't have an O line or trash either way. So just ask Jimmy Clausen. So. <laughs> All right, Kevin, uh, we're going to jump over to Adam here, uh, who uh, was on earlier. Thank you, Kevin Davis, for your contributions. Jump in at any point. Adam Dowling, hello, or maybe it's Mrs. Dowling, at Adam Adam underscore Dowling1 on Twitter. You've been invited to speak, sir. Uh, Welcome back to the show if you wish to join us. Um, while we wait for Adam to jump on, before we jump into receivers, we're going to give the Twitter shout out. Uh, so I uh, I got a, a tweet, a message here from Dr. Abby at It's Abby Be Happy on Twitter. And uh, she she picked up on the reference I made last week where I was talking about my expectations for the season. And I had mentioned that I have a very high expectation this season, regardless of my preseason ranking rant from earlier. But my expectation is that Notre Dame needs to win a New Year's Six, okay, Cotton Bowl, Sugar Bowl, what have you. Um, that is my expectation this year. I think we, with the quarterback we have and the and the roster that we're going to talk about tonight returning, um, I think we have what it takes uh, to get there, assuming we win a couple of these big games here. Now, that being said, I also followed up and says, I don't want to, quote, settle for a New Year's Six win. I would, quote, rather win the whole damn thing. To which Dr. Abby, I don't know if she is actually a doctor, but if she has respect, you know, doctor of physical therapy, orthopedic surgeon, oncology, or your uh, uh, doctor, Dr. Pepper. I don't (laughs) I don't know. Um, but, uh, she made a reference to major league, 
um, and it, which I think I made that same reference as well. So Twitter shout out is going to at it's Abby be happy on Twitter. So thank you, which who d- is not jumping on tonight, but that's fine. Maybe she's shy and she got to get up early to, you know, s- you know, suit your people up in the ER or something. Who knows? All right. So moving on. Adam says 11 days, RTDB and Watts Henderson Brown rotation. That's cool. Well, Adam, you're you're texting me stuff, but you don't want to jump on. What are you sitting in bed? The, the missus is asleep or you don't want to wake up the dog? I don't know. And that's cool if you are. No problem. All right, moving on. Okay, receivers, everybody's favorite topic other than mine. <laughs> But, you know, receivers is huge, and I just spent a lot of time talking about Sam Hartman. We got to talk about receivers. So, clearly, notable departures, Michael Mayer, Braden Lindsey, Logan Diggs, and Lorenzo Styles. All th- four of those men did score touchdowns. And there's a couple other uh, guys who did catch passes, but I only really looked at the guys who were scoring t- touchdowns. And why is that? You all know why. Because the national champion, the number two most important stat, is receiving touchdowns and not only that the national champion of the last 10 years there there's 41 passing touchdowns or 41 receiving touchdowns however you want to how you ever want to divide that up so notre dame did not have 41 last year <laughs> not even close uh, a little more than half of that we had 25 so um that's kind of where we are at um bum, 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 wah, wah, wah. yep exactly the um so of the 25 mayor accounted for nine Lindsay had three Diggs had two and styles had one so what's interesting from just we just look at receiving um Diggs and styles have transferred of course Lindsay's done with his eligibility and mayor's about to go you know kick ass in the nfl for the raiders um, the departure of Diggs and Styles doesn't leave too much of a hole, just three of those touchdowns gone. But when you take into account nine by Mayer, um, who had more than Lindsey Thomas and Diggs combined, um, you know, you throw Tyree in there and, and then, OK, finally, you know, they over overcome the the mad force that was Michael Mayer. Um but we just have 10 receiving touchdowns from last year, quote, remaining on the team with Thomas, Tyree, Estime, Mitchell Evans, Deion Colsey, Matt Salerno, and Tobias Merriweather. So so that is a problem. That that does raise some concerns. Um, now, if we go over to yard points, um, Notre Dame had 2,637 yards receiving last year from all these men I've just mentioned. Um, only 37% remain less than a thousand. So not good. Um, and if we go over to just receptions, it's, it's, it's about the same 37%. So now what's interesting is if you take the average reception per catch or yards per catch, um, the leader on this whole grouping was actually Tobias Merriweather. Merriweather had one catch for 41 yards, so he statistically is the winner, I guess. You know, it's, I guess that's not very good math, an average of one. Um, it'd be nice if he had 30 to 15 or more um, to be statistically significant. But regardless, um, the average is of one is 41, so there you go. So I guess he's the most efficient, so why did he only catch one ball? I don't know. Or it's just a fluke thing. It's, you know, it's an outlier in the data um but anyway he, he's got one reception for every touchdown you know wow that's great um mitchell evans that's an interesting one so everyone remembers kind of that package where he just come in and just kind of bulldoze people in and you know take handoffs you know he got a rushing touchdown doing that as well um but yeah every he had a total of three receptions and one touchdown so one out of three Hey, that's a that's a touchdown. So way way to go, Mitchell Evans. Um, what's interesting though is if you look at the average of receptions and if you look at receptions per touchdown as a whole, the team averaged twelve point seven yards per catch and eight point three receptions per touchdown. 
Now, if you take away Mayer and Lindsey Diggs and Styles, and you just look at who's left, the actual average is the same, 12.7. So that's really interesting. And then you look at receptions per touchdown, it, it gets a little, um, it actually gets better. It drops to 7.6 on average. So what it tells me is we're going to get more efficient with the receivers here without actually, um, you know, dropping off in like yardage production or something. If, if, if the yardage was really small, like less than 10 yards and the, uh, receptions per touchdown average had also dropped that to me would say like, Oh, these guys are just catching things in the red zone and they're kind of getting these, you know, onesie twosie kind of passes. Um, so that, that kind of made me feel a little better about that. All right. So that's the that's kind of it on the receiver side. You know, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward when you look at receivers. There's nothing too crazy um going on there. I bet Adam is definitely on doing texting here. What are you doing? What's it? Uh, have a good shot. Had to wake up at 3 30 Central. Go Irish. Okay. Good night, Adam Dowling. <laughs> that's right. I think he, he works in uh one of the big industries there, so he's got to uh he needs some shut eye to pay attention to what he's doing, which is fine. Adam, sorry, I didn't start the podcast sooner. Or is it like just a summer thing and then in the fall you'll stay up later or you're just getting older? I don't know. That's okay. Maybe we'll just see you after post games and if I can put my toddler to bed earlier. That's fine too. All right. Well, since Adam is uh, wanting me to uh, sing him a lullaby here to sleep, We'll see if at Pello Jace um, has anything to say about the receivers, defense, or even running the football. Jay, if you're there, by all means, jump on. So, yeah, I definitely do. And uh, it's all about Tyree. Okay. I mean, think about it. Uh, here's a guy who is quick, who can, who can, you know, make plays in open space. And you're going to move him from running back to slot receiver. Yes. I mean, I think, and and Freeman already said he's going to be your your um, both kickoff and punt returner. There I mean, you go. I think I think Tyree is going to do some special things this season. We'll see. I I really hope so. You know, it's it's my it's my understanding that if a coach is going to totally move somebody from one position to another. Um, it's with intent to help the team out and utilize his strengths and his abilities to help this team in a better way. And usually that also results in more playing time. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that John Goodman, when he played, he originally came in as a quarterback and then was moved over to like a wide receiver. Um, and you know, in 2012, he had a couple couple of decent catches. One of my favorite catches of all that season was against uh, uh, Michigan State, uh, which which was a huge missile that uh, that Ever Golson chucked and got him in the end zone. Right. So so if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to the uh, go to the highlights of the Michigan State game um, that myself and Dos Leprechauns produced out there out there on the YouTube. But anyway, we. Um, what I wanted to know is, is do you think he's going to have like, do you, do you think it's going to be like a real breakout year for him? Kind of like theoretic when he was moved to running back and just kind of got stupid, crazy good at receiver. Or do you think it's going to be kind of more like, I don't, I don't want to talk bad about Braden Lindsay, but like, how do you, how do you say have a Braden Lindsay career without it saying bad? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'll tell you how I want it to be and how I think it's going to be. It's two different things. Mm -hmm. I, I really want, because I'm a huge Tyree fan. I mean, I mean ever since Wisconsin game, right? <laughs> I yeah. mean, so, you know, I want him to have a breakout season where he's um, not only dominant, you know, returning balls you know from kickoffs and punts but you know in that slot position where 
Mayer was really the only person last year. And, you know, Tyree's not going to be the only person, but I think in that slot position, I think he can really shine, you know, get him the ball, let him, you know, create some space and, and run. I think, you know, he has that opportunity, but, you know, I don't know with a new quarterback, uh, with the focus on trying to make sure that other receivers get the ball also while trying to make sure that the entire stable of running backs get touches that it's going to be a lot for him. But I think yeah. when he does, when he does that have, have that opportunity, he's going to, you know, excel at it. So, I mean, it, it's my, everyone knows how fast Tyree is and it, and it would be almost, you know, a crime or whatever to, to not target him more. Um, What's really interesting is I was looking at um, the stats from the 87 season. Um, and something that I noticed um, was Tim Brown. He had, I think, just as many receiving touchdowns as he did like punt return touchdowns that year. And and clearly his punt returns and, and that electricity is why he won the Heisman. Um, so I'm okay if, if Tyree's production on the field as far as like you know plays from scrimmage and that sort of thing are um are kind of kind of mediocre mediocre kind of kind of situation um if he's giving us a huge huge boost in the special teams yep i agree with that yeah 100 percent. because we've seen him in special teams do crazy amazing things um and we can play play the clip if you want. Um, <laughs> let's play the clip. Let's find the clip. Why not? Yeah, go for it. Yep. All right. Where are you at? Tyree. Here's Tyree with the lane. Tyree! Whoa! Can he get there? Tyree at the 30, 20, 10, touchdown, Notre Dame! Woo! Oh yeah. <laughs> so if, if that's what's happening, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yep. Got no problem with that. Now, what do you think of these uh these new recruits that that we got coming in? We got quite a bit of receivers, you know, versus, you know, last year all we really had was Merriweather. Um and he didn't really get targeted at all. Now maybe that's a function of our quarterbacks, that's a function of Reese or um, you know, we have Mayer and Lindsay and some of these other guys, um, you know, so so maybe Merriweather couldn't really just break in there. But between Braylon James and even Cooper Flanagan, who's a tight end, and I don't know if he's actually going to redshirt or if he's actually going to play, but you never know. Um, and then you've got, um, if I scroll down, you got Great House, Rico Flores. And um, yeah, so, so what are your thoughts on these young guys? So if I go by what uh, Marcus Freeman said in his, uh, uh, you know, interview, uh, Flores and Great House are going to be uh, factors this year for sure. Uh, I'm hoping that Merriweather is the guy. I mean, he has the speed, he has the size. Um, I think that you know, if you've got if you've got a running game, you've got the deep threat with Merriweather, you've got uh, the slot threat with, um, you know, I think that the future is wide open for this offense, really and truly. I mean, Great House showed great things in the spring game. I mm-hmm. think that Flores showed some, some great things. I think if they're as good as they showed – yeah, it, the offense is going to be well taken care of this season. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it even makes me excited not to not to look you know too much into twenty twenty four here, but with CJ Carr and then you know Cam Williams coming in you know next year in the freshman class, um, you know there there's some there's they're keying. The, I'm happy that Marcus Freeman and our coaches are keying in on 
on the receivers because it, it has to be necessary. You know, if, if, you know, all the data people, all the operations people, you do some Pareto chart, which is kind of what I do here with the stats, like as far as prioritizing things, it's like, look, these are the significant few things you must focus on because all these good teams are doing that. And that's kind of what, and, and everyone kind of in college football kind of does the same thing, you know, like, look, if we can run triple option and it's down to perfection with Estime or whatever, you know, great. But I don't, I don't see that working with Sam Hartman, for example, right? He's a, I, I was thinking today of pro quarterbacks that he, I think could remind me of, and I settled upon Dan Marino. Oh, that's good. So, yeah. so I was like, okay, if, if, Dan Marino is our guy in Grand Nova won a Super Bowl, but it's like, you know, he was legit at Pitt and he was legit with the Dolphins and, you know, through at, at, you know, I don't know how many records he still holds, but, you know, I'm okay with that. <laughs> That's that was kind of the vibe I was getting. I was like, I'm going with a Dan Marino kind of vibe from him. And so, yeah, I'd be okay with that. Yeah. I mean, Artman's a, he's, he's a talent. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody says about him. He's a talent and um, I'm happy he's playing for Notre Dame this year. Uh, I don't know that Notre Dame would have as optimistic a season without him being there this year. So, yeah, I think I think the um, I think you've hit something really spot on right there. If we had not gotten sam hartman i i think that things would feel different for sure you know all all these all these guys i'm really talking about tonight and production and efficiencies and receptions and then when we jump over here to the uh the rushing game um it's really going to be the audric estime show um but pretty much like like these things make you feel good um, and then when you throw a Hartman in there, it's like, oh, I feel great. You know, um, if I think you've hit something really key that if we still had Pine or Buckner or something and, and Hartman like went to the NFL or just stayed at Wake Forest or went even somewhere else, um, I think things would feel differently, but we, we got him. He's ours. We don't have to have to hypothesize that, that false reality. Right. Yeah. For sure. So I don't even I don't even really want to go there because when we got him, I was just like, "Great, this is fantastic." Yeah, I mean, how many times do you get a, a known quantity of a quarterback that can pass and pass with precision? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, in the uh, in the uh, spirit of Adam Dowling, who said RTDB. Right. He's uh he's uh he's appealing to me. I say we jump over to rushing. Let's diversify here our portfolio sure. here. Let's not just talk about passing and Hartman. Okay, rushing. All right, here's the deal. The best thing about rushing is we have sixty percent of all of our rushing touchdowns returning. Um Buckner had four rushing rushing touchdowns, Diggs had four. And Pine actually had two. All three of those men combined do not have as many rushing touchdowns that Estime had last year. Estime had 11. And he individually scored a touchdown every 14 times he touched the ball. Now, here's the best part about that. That is better than the national champion average. National champions score a touchdown every 15.7 touches and our running back does it in 14.2 now i i didn't go into looking at you know what heisman guys do i i am slowly starting to build a tab here in the spreadsheet that is literally labeled rtdb and it will it, it encompasses a ton a shit ton of notre dame running backs like like name somebody from jarius jackson to Tyree to CJ Procise, Alan Pinkett, um, Dexter Williams, one of my favorite of all time, Vegas Ferguson, um, the the great of the greats in in Notre Dame, and you know over the last like you know 30, 40 years or whatever. 
Um, but I think we need to also make sure we add some Heisman guys. Um, as far as like, okay, like, yes, that's cool that we're comparing the Notre Dame guys, but we need to also look at Heisman guys. But anyway, yeah, back so, to back to. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Jay. I say first shout out is to Doctor Adams. I mean, <laughs> if we're gonna talk running backs, we got to talk about Josh Adams. Josh Dr. Adams. Adams. Yep. You know, and that's interesting. Like, so, so I, this isn't a full analysis here because, um, I have, I have one column that's, that's ready to go and it's, well, it's not really a column. It's like six columns, but it's about single season stats and who did the best in an individual season as far as, you know, yards or touchdowns or yards per carry and things of that nature. And, um, Josh Adams, um, He's really good in, in 2017. Um, you know, he ended up having, you know, quite quite a few touchdowns there. Um, but he, what I thought was interesting is how many times he carries the ball before he scores a touchdown. And that was 22.9 carries per touchdown. Wow. Which seems really, really high. Yep. Now, the best on this, as far as like people who had over 100 carries, is actually Jonas Gray from 2011. He scored a touchdown every 9.5 times. After that is actually Brandon Wimbush. Recall <laughs> that Wimbush actually had the most rushing touchdowns. He had more than Josh Adams. Wimbush had 14 in 2017. That's interesting. It uh, is. I, I it really know. is. Yeah. Now, Dexter Williams, in 2018, he scored every 13 touches. And put up the two every time he yeah, scored. Yeah, the peace yeah. sign, the deuce. Yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> Which made it better because he wore the number two, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, But yeah, no, Josh Adams, 33 trucking, all of that. Everyone remembers that really well. And he put up a shit ton of yards, right? 14 point, uh, excuse me, 1,430 yards that season and that that's i think why everyone remembers him and as far as who i have on this list he has more than than darius walker and you know 2005 2006 both of them um the next guy uh would be kyron williams who had um 1100 in 2020 and and he probably would have had more if it was actually a a full you know 12 13 game season right right yeah. Um, but yeah, Kyron Williams had finished in 2020 with 13 uh, touchdowns. Oh, Kyron. I, I mean, as, as a Rams fan in the NFL, I'm following him still. Yes. He's, he's RB2 for, for the Rams right now. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that he is at least continuing his career. So. No doubt, you know, I and I've I've said this, you know, up and down. I always want Notre Dame players to be successful at the next level. You know, now do I track them with the same level of scrutiny and whatnot that we do at Notre Dame? No, but um, you know, they're still part of the family, so you know, peace be exactly. Yep. Now. You were mentioning Tyree, and, and clearly he's moved over to the receiving group. So I didn't necessarily take him away from the rushing touchdowns column uh, because he's still technically on the team. But if you really wanted to be pessimistic with the stats, you would eliminate Tyree because he's quote unquote not a running back. Now, yeah, I would. Yeah. He, in theory, he could. We, we don't know if that will continue. Because then if you if you really step away, like, OK, who are the quote unquote returning running backs that made notable contributions other than Estime, it's only Tyree. You know, Diggs is gone and then Buckner kind of did his thing when he was in. Um, but then what's really cool about that is who are the quote unquote new guys? Now, two of these guys aren't necessarily new but do you know who I'm talking about? Who I'm really excited? Uh, you tell me. I, I have my in my mind. But you tell me. Jadarian Price. Yep. Oh, yeah. The price, I hope, is right. I am so excited 
for Jadarian Price. Anyone at Notre Dame, and I said this after the spring game two years ago. This is before his injury. Notre Dame, if you're listening to me, when Price scores a touchdown, you need to play this shit in the stadium. <laughs> I love it. Okay, call call CBS, call ABC. I don't even know who does the prices right anymore, right? I think it's CBS. Get the rights, okay, to play this in public, right? Okay, did I... Maybe I'll just turn it down, but... <laughs> Look, we do this for fun, right? You know, this is just a podcast right. for fun. But Janarian Price, look, he was a four-star. He was the 32nd best recruit in all of the state of Texas. He was the 17th ranked nationally running back. And, you know, he's been in the program for a while. Yes, he's battling injuries coming back. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Now, in the same class, um, the 11th best recruit out of Ohio and number 25th nationally running back was... Um, pain, um, but he sat out last year as well. Okay. So anyway, so that's cool. Now, something else that was interesting, I was looking at our existing uh, players and, and who our current recruits are coming in. Jeremiah Love. This guy, four-star recruit, he was the third best recruit out of the state of Missouri and the number fifth ranked uh, running back nationally. And I, I, I was doing some show prep last night and watched some film of him, and that dude can make an edge. Now, it's not quite Reggie Bush uh, good at running the edge, um, but he's very he has very good feet, and he's very patient waiting for the hole to open, which is great, fantastic. It reminds me of Dexter Williams a little bit. Didn't quite have the boogie that Dexter Williams does, but very patient in the pocket. And what's also was revealing about Jeremiah Love, this dude is definitely a Notre Dame guy. He signed on October 15th, 2022. Does anyone remember what happened that night? Not a clue. That's the night we lost to Stanford. Oh, wow. And he, he made a verbal commit to Notre Dame after that shit show. So that shows that this dude is all Notre Dame even after that crap. So. <laughs> so this entire running back room is phenomenal. I mean, yes. other would be jealous for sure. Well, and I think, I think Estime is, is the experienced one. And then these, these other three, three guys I just mentioned are, are, are young and hungry and ready to, to, you know, just go out there and kill it. And then you've got Devin Ford. Let's not forget him who transferred in from Penn State. Um, and he played as a true freshman at Penn State in 2019. Now, I didn't I didn't go down the whole history of him at Penn State and with injury or whatever. Um, and I don't even know if he's had an injury, but um, we've got him as well. So we have estimate. That's the that is the known quantity um, price. If anyone remembers from the spring game two years ago. We saw all sorts of goodness with him um, between him and Angeli. They were the quote players of the game. Um, but yeah, price, if he scores touchdowns, man, I'm, I'm ready for that guy to just start to move and to go. I'm excited. I'm really excited. Yeah. Me too. Me too. I think, I think this season, if I mean, really and truly, if, if the receivers, can sync with Hartman, then, you know, as long as the off- offensive coordinator can actually make those decisions, there's no defending this team. Yeah, yeah. Well, and a lot of this will depend on our linemen. True. If, yeah. if our line sucks um, and is not good, then you know, we're, we're going to have some problems here. But... As, assuming the the line is uh, is adequate, is decent, and um, is clearly improved from last year, um, I think we'll be okay. You know, some of these things that our line and kind of the the team in general must improve on, of course, is um, tackles for loss against us, um, and and sacks against um, tackles for loss allowed last year. Um, yeah, you know, it wasn't terrible. We were actually pretty 
we were okay. Um, we we averaged four point two three, um, which is actually pretty good. Now that now that I revisit this, um, we were ranked sixteenth in the country in tackles for loss allowed last year, which is interesting, um, because it didn't feel that way. <laughs> No, I mean, I think it all boils down to, you know, the red zone defense, right? You know, if, if we can improve upon that, then we've we've made a major step. Now, now our defense or... or the... Yeah, our, our, our defense. Yeah, yeah. L- let me come back to that because cause okay. you've hit, right. you've hit the, like, if we're really talking about, you know, warning lights on the dashboard, that's the one. Um, sacks allowed, th- this is this is where I'm at. Um we're actually right on par with national champion average of 40.3. We were ranked 40th last year, allowing 1.6 sacks against us. So it doesn't sound good um, when you look at the ranking. But if you think like, oh, we were only sacked one to two times, it's actually not that bad. So um, the worst it ever was was actually in 2021, believe it or not. But, you know, I guess that's what happens with Jack Cohn. I don't know. <laughs> he he didn't know how to run. I'm just I, saying. I just you know he just got concrete feet you know. <laughs> right yeah and I, I, he was a great passer. Yeah. I, I loved him as a passer, but he did not know how to do anything beyond that. Right. So. Well, as we get into the defensive talks, we can we can go real macro and and what really needs to improve now. Red zone scoring defense and red zone touchdown percentage on defense there are not the the quote-unquote most important defensive stats you know those would be scoring defense total defense and rushing defense etc um but you go farther down the list these things do make the top top grouping here uh, for things that we will pay attention to and notre dame was really really bad uh last year uh let's go the worst to the best it's not really that good um our opponents scored in the red zone they scored touchdowns excuse me touchdowns in the red zone 79 percent of the time almost four out of five times our opponents scored touchdowns every time they got in the red zone and that was the absolute bottom of the barrel 131st in the country not good bob not good no Uh, i need that clip damn it Uh, i gotta do better show prep um then red zone scoring percentage on defense so that includes field goals our opponents scored in the red zone 94% of the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, we weren't the worst in the country. Uh, yay. Uh, <laughs> we we're the next worst, 130th in the country. So really not worst is not good. Really bad. Really bad. And what's interesting uh-huh. is if um, in 2019, it was very similar um, percentage wise it was actually worse it was 96 percent of the time but we were ranked 129th in the country in 2019 so not good I, and i don't know that what you know i guess we could break down film and roster personnel or whatever about what was wrong with our defense in in 2019 um and why opponents scored so often against us in the red zone However, you know, the numbers are what they are, and it's uh, it's what I do to inform you all. <laughs> I'm, I'm very quickly trying to decide, as I, as I check Google, who our defensive coordinator was then. In 2019? Yeah. Oh, that definitely would have still been Clark Lee. <laughs> That's that's just too, too isn't bad. that weird? Because, yeah, it is weird because it is weird. I mean, I would have not expected that, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me verify this. I'm pretty. I'm like ninety nine percent sure that's the case. Da, da, da. Oh, was it his first are... year? No, it was not. Yeah, twenty nineteen was Clark Lee. And that was uh, his first year was 2018. Now, if you recall, so, like the likes of Julian Love and those guys departed. Yeah. Um, but then 2020, it, it kind of corrects itself 
which was um, Clark Lee's last year with us. And then, then it was Marcus Freeman. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I, when, when Freeman came in and, and the first game hit and people were like, Freeman's not good. And I'm like, no, you got to give him a chance because he really is good. Yeah, it, it it got better as the season went on, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, like like go into the uh, uh, the uh, Wisconsin game, right? Right. You know that was that was twenty twenty one. Now you know the game after that against uh, um, Cincinnati wasn't so great. That was a loss, but I don't think that was necessarily because the defense let us down. Um, that was necessary. That was more so, I think, because the offense just did nothing. <laughs> right. No, I, I agree with that one hundred percent. Yeah. You know, and, and Kyron Williams can't do absolutely everything. So, um, yeah. I mean, we could we could go down that that rabbit hole if we really want to to rehash that game. But um, for now, let's 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 move into the future here with uh, what Notre Dame's assuming going into twenty twenty three. Um, we got defense here and we'll, we'll invite Kevin to jump in cause he can, he can definitely, uh, fill some gaps. Uh, and that was, that was legit, legitimate pun there. Um, we talked about who, who are the notable departures, Foskey, Tariq Bracey, the Amiola brothers, Brandon Joseph, and sadly, Bo Bauer, the sharp hockey skate is gone. Now, of course, Bo Bauer had uh, an injury last year that kind of uh, sidelined him for a good part of the season. Um, what's really interesting is if we if we jump straight to recruiting, um, you know, the top two guys are both um, edge rushers or D linemen. Then you got Christian Gray, who's a cornerback, uh, Drake Bowen. Everyone's talked about him at linebacker. Um, Ben Minich at safety, or, or well, who came in as an athlete, but now is listed as a safety, and then Micah Bell at cornerback, and there's there's multiple other guys. Um, and then we have Jean Baptiste, of course, our uh, transfer from Ohio State. So so lots of new faces on the defense, and um, to hopefully uh, fill in for some of these notable departures. Now, what yes. gives? Hi, Kevin. I was going to say the key thing about about what you just said is depth, right? Now we have depth. Like there's people behind people that gives us a lot of more comfort that if somebody goes down, there's somebody there that can at least pick up the slack, especially at linebacker. I think there's enough depth there where if one of them guys go down, the guys behind them are, are capable. Correct. Right? So I think that's super important with, with what we have. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Now, though Isaiah Foskey, if we jump into some of these stats here, let's do tackles for loss first and sacks. Um, clearly, Foskey, you know, car- carried his weight um, in being the driving force behind uh, sacks and tackles for loss. 11 sacks for Foskey and 14 tackles for loss last season. But what's great is the next three guys in the tackles for loss are J.D. Burchan, Jordan Bethello, and Riley Mills, who are returning. After Foskey in the sacks department, you have Jordan Bethello, Riley Mills, and then, okay, you got the Amioli brothers, but then you have Kaiser and Bertrand after that. Now, if we jump straight over to total tackles, you have Bertrand with 82 last year, Kaiser with 58 last year, Liafau with 51 last year dj brown he's still with the team he had 48 then you have foskey so you have to go five levels down to hit the next guy who had the most quote total tackles what i think is great about this those top three guys what position do they all play linebacker and what a departure that is where, you know, when, when Kyle Hamilton was on the team, where a safety is like one of our leading tacklers, which isn't necessarily bad, but it's like, why is a safety who's supposed to be 20, 15 plus yards back ma- being the primary, you know, tackler, unless, you know, he's just all over the field because your opponent is passing. 
I think it's great that Bertrand, Kaiser, and Lyafow are the top three guys um, from last year as far as uh, accumulating the total number of tackles. And those three guys are on the team still and guaranteed, guaranteed to make contributions. So really, really pumped. Now, if I jump over to the fumble department, uh, or fumble recovery recoveries and forced fumbles, no one individual really jumps out uh, as far as, um, you know, having multiple fumble recoveries or forced fumbles and stuff like that. So to me, that's kind of a wash. Now, of course, if we go over to the interception department, oh, everyone knows who I'm going to talk about next. Benjamin Morrison. Truth or a lie, Benjamin Morrison had six interceptions last year. He did. That's truth. He had six interceptions. I'd have to go back to figure out, you know, I, I didn't do this. It's just kind of me thinking out loud right now. But who's the last person who had six interceptions in a season as a freshman? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so so what and, and what's interesting about that, that's good and bad. It's good because that means we have an amazing talent out there who can lock down, hopefully at corner, you know, a our opponent's number one target receiver. So that's good. So we can we can eliminate that threat or or reduce the uh, the volatility of that threat from our opponent. Or if you're you know someone like a Caleb Williams or a Drake May or whomever you know uh, we're not playing North Carolina this year, but if we were, you know, and they had their favorite target, you can hopefully eliminate them. Okay, and Benjamin Morrison hopefully is faster and stronger and. Uh, you know, he's, I don't, I, he's probably not meaner because he's actually a pretty nice guy, but <laughs> I think what his dad's a minister or preacher or something like that, which is dope. But anyway, um, yeah, that's just kind of how that, how that rolls. So, well, I see Lynch is on here at Lynch mob ND. That's a, that's a, you know, kind of tongue in cheek Twitter account. I don't follow you. How do I not follow you? Jason Lynch. What the deuce? All right. Following you now. At Lynch Mob ND, a uh, member of the Dos Leprechauns uh, universe here. Um, you're invited to speak if you so wish. I guess I got to actually hit the button that says invite to speak. Uh, but yeah, we're talking about defense. We talked a little bit about running the football and about passing. Um, so if you want to jump on, by all means, jump on. So. Can I ask you a quick question? Absolutely, Kevin. Do you know who's the last Notre Dame um, player to have over 100 tackles? Would it be, would it be Taylor? Uh, that that would take some time. If someone has uh, has a, a funny story to tell, I could maybe look it up real quick. <laughs> but <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to, but I couldn't find much online. I couldn't. You know, there's um, I'm on my 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 super secret. Uh, it's not that secret, but it's a. Uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really do a whole lot. Yeah, this is bad radio, I know. Uh stats, receiving, scoring, defense. Yeah, so so defensive stuff is is a lot harder to to find per se. Um like for example, if we were talking about receiving or rushing or something like that or even passing, you know, said website I'm looking at does every season, you know. So, like, for example, sports reference, right? Okay, here's one of my secrets. Sportsreference.com. Um, really good at navigating um, through all of college football. And um, it immediately highlights that Michael Floyd is, you know, the leader um, in in total receptions. Um, after that, it's Golden Tate, then Samarja, um, then Derek Mays. Okay. So, so the, um, but the defensive side of the ball and like who had the most tackles or tackles in a season and stuff like that, that, that will take some time. Um, now if I jump over to Manti, let me, uh, like, do you, th do, Kevin, do you think it's Manti? I think it's Manti. Yeah. He, I think that's he had a lot. Let's see. As a career, 
He had 436 total tackles. Yeah, he actually cracked the century mark three times in 2010, 2011, and 2012. And actually, 2010, he had the most total tackles with 133. I would love to see a linebacker get up to like that 100 mark. Yeah. I would love to see that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think he had, what, like seven, eight interceptions, something to that effect. So, um, you know, really, really good, uh, you know, really, really good, really good impact by him. So, but yeah, you, I, I'd have to go season by season to see who the last guy was. Um, I mean, we could try to do this real quick, but, uh, we don't want to people to fall asleep no brush. behind the wheel. I was just asking. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> let me do that. I'll, I'll, that, that'll be something we'll put on Twitter here. Who had, or who was, I guess, a, is that what you're asking? Who is the last defender with yeah, 100, 100 plus 100. tackles? Now, is that total tackles, solo tackles, or all the above? Uh, total. I don't think nobody had 100 solos. That would be absolutely crazy. That would be crazy, be- yeah. Manti never <laughs> had that. He was up in the 60s. Yeah. So if that's the case, then your entire defense is trash. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I see, I see Mr. Jason Lynch here. He put himself on mute. Um, you can hit the pink button in the lower left-hand corner if you so wish to join us and contribute tonight. Um, it's not quite morning yet. It's 11 o'clock. Jason, welcome to the Fighting Irish Faithful Show. What's up, buddy? Yo! How's things going? Oh, it's nice. Nice, nice weather tonight we're having compared to what we have had. Right, I'll, I'll tell you what. We... I'm like, I need to cut my grass here, but it keeps raining up here in central Indiana. So, okay, darn, I don't have to do that chore, right? (laughs) Are you getting like a fall, fall chill in the air kind of where you're at right now? Or or, or are you still kind of like, is summer still teasing you a little bit? Yeah, we're supposed to get down into the middle 60s tonight. And then, you know, for the next few days, I think it's highs in the 80s. But then it goes back to a hundred plus next week. Oh, well, that sucks. Well, hopefully the humidity is not as uh, as atrocious as it has been uh, in days of yore. But uh, yeah, no, the uh, I, I think fall is starting to creep in. Like Doc was saying something to me about how she opened, cracked the windows and she was like, "Oh, I was loving the fresh air," and then she got cold or whatever. And I'm like, "Okay, fine." <laughs> Right. I'm like, I'm at work. I'm I'm in an office building all day, so I don't, I can't really relate. I'm sometimes I feel like a vampire, and because at one point I was in manufacturing and I was working in a building that had no windows, and especially in the winter, it's like I never saw the sun. Like I went in, it was dark. I come out to my car, it's dark. It's like I'm just a vampire. I don't, I don't know what the sun is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be rough. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's okay. It's uh, you know, it's just what you got to do. So, what are you? Uh, what are your thoughts? So, we're we're talking specifically. Uh, we we did quarterbacks last week, and now we're doing the rest of the team tonight. <laughs> I got in about the time you started talking about Morrison. Um, and yeah, as far as like, I don't, I can't remember as far as who had as far as career interceptions. Mm. I want to say it's been a while, but I. I almost lean toward maybe Luther Bradley. Okay. Um, it seems like that was at one time one of the interception record holders. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not so sure about him. I was. I was uh, going to lean towards um, for uh, um, uh, Kyle Hamilton, but he actually only amassed eight total in his career, which is interesting. Really? Yeah. More than that, but yeah. Um, now Harrison Smith, on the other hand, where do you think he is? Do you think he's at eight or above or lower? I would say probably above, maybe. Maybe. So, so four. you would think because in one season he had seven. He had seven interceptions in 2010, but that's it. 
Huh. He had no other interceptions per my source here. He had no other interceptions in any other season. But then if you jump over to Benjamin Morrison, who had six for us last season, um, it's it's absolutely fantastic, right? Right, right. First so, season. Yeah. And then three in one game. Ooh, I don't I don't have that level of detail, but I, I know he had two in the Clemson game. Right. I thought he um, might have had maybe in in the Boston College game. Oh yeah, I bet I bet there's some goodness there. Uh let's see here. I wonder if I know this is bad this is bad radio here, but if I click on his name should have give me his game stats here. Or maybe it only does that for quarterbacks. I don't know. Game logs. Boom. Okay, there we go. Let's see here. Interceptions. Oh, you're 100% right. Three in Boston College, two in Clemson, and one against South Carolina. Okay. So when Benjamin Morrison gets interceptions, we always win. (laughs) We'll take that. I'll I'll take that. When he has zero, let's see. He's got one, two, three. He's got four losses when he has zero, and he's got one, two, three, uh, six wins when he also has zero. So... I don't know. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> I wonder: Did he play all ten games or twelve games last season, or was he? He played all thirteen games. Thirteen, yeah, thirteen. Yeah, the only the only game that he didn't have, um, well, actually that's not true. He had two games that didn't have where he didn't like get a tackle or some to that effect, and that was Marshall, vomit, and BYU. Okay, but maybe he maybe he got on a really hot streak at a craps table, and so he was like, "Like, screw you guys, I'm gonna no, probably not." But <laughs> it's like, like if you're on a, if you're on a heater on the table, like you don't leave, right? It's a hot table. You you keep playing, right? <laughs> I was I was at a I was at a family reunion a couple weeks ago, which is why last week's quote last week's show was moved to a Friday, and not the normal quote unquote normal Tuesday night midweek. Um, And my plane got delayed. It was, it was messed up. But anyway, uh, the, the last night of our family reunion, I was talking to red snapper. I'm like, you know, there's a casino not far from where we're at. And so like, we actually got to talk into like my great aunt and my grandmother who was, is celebrating a hundred years of birth. Uh, Tomorrow is her birthday. (laughs) Um, And we're like, let's all go to the casino. And so we're like, yeah, let's go. (laughs) And then one of my cousins was like, we're like teaching him how to play craps, like in the backyard and stuff. And we're like, does anyone have a game of monopoly? Like here, we'll show you what, what, this is what you do. (laughs) Um, So I looked on Wikipedia, of course, as accurate as that. Oh, it's pure truth, man. Pure truth. Yeah. But it shows single or uh, career interceptions was Luther Bradley was 17. Interesting. Wow. Uh, 73 to 70. He doesn't make the list here. I don't know why. But I believe you. I'm not going to I'm not going to debate you here. Right. There should be like I don't know if Notre Dame has it on their page, but there should be like a records Page, you would think with all the I, I agree I'm I'm using you know a third party uh, um, website here so you know we'll we'll see what where that goes but yeah ND career interception stats for Jason Lynch <laughs> just, well no just to see how accurate wikipedia is oh no 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 i i heard you loud and clear this is this is what you want to know but like 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 l- let's think about that you know interceptions turnovers takeaways you know it's a huge momentum shift you know it's it's a ability to steal points away from your opponent um if you go back to i think it was 2018 um where 
you know, Michigan, excuse me, we were playing at Michigan State, and Michigan State just coughed the ball up left and right. Um, and though they're, they're, you know, they put up a lot of yards, you know, they would fumble at, at certain points. At one point, they fumbled on the goal line and we recovered. So the, um, if our defense can, can, you know, get takeaways, quite frankly, um, right. you know, that's, that's, that's fantastic, right? <clears throat> For sure. You know, I mean, we don't have to be, we don't have to be the, the quote unquote best in turnover margin. Cause like one thing, one thing I started looking at, like a couple years ago when I, when I started producing this spreadsheet, you know, I was getting really wrapped around the axles on the turnover piece because turnovers are like, fumbles our fumbles the opponent's fumbles interceptions interceptions we throw etc and i was like you know what let's simplify this just because i'll lose my mind and rather than track you know five or six stats let's just track one and so i i use turnover margin in aggregate not per game but the total sum and so it's it it takes into account the turnovers that Notre Dame has, and then also what we take away from our opponent. Now, national champions on average end up with a value of eight, ranked twenty four point six, about twenty fifth in the country in turnover margin. Now, last year was was not good. It wasn't the worst it ever was, um, but we were in the negatives. The last time we were in the we were minus three last year. We were ranked 86 in the country. The last time we were negative, Jason, just name a year. The last time Notre Dame was negative in turnover margin. I'll give you a hint. It was our the last time we went under 500. Last time under 500. 14, was it 14, 15? 2016. 16, okay. Yeah. We were ranked 90th in the country. We were minus nine. Now, that's actually not the worst in the Kelly era. The worst was actually 2011. We were minus 15 in turnover oh. margin. Absolutely atrocious. Really bad. Yeah. So... So anyway, um, Benjamin Morrison interceptions, forced fumbles. You know, we, we didn't get a whole lot of fumbles last year. And the, the, if if I'm if I'm the defense, you know, other than Benjamin Morrison keep getting interceptions, um, we got to get some fumble fumble recoveries, forced fumbles, etc. Um, and and that's an area where I think anyone on the team can be impactful. Yes. Yes, so. and a lot of it you see. I, and I I watch you know more high school ball I guess over the course of the year. Um, you see a lot of these kids they're they're not trying to wrap up and tackle they're trying to strip the ball, and a lot of times that just you know the fundamental is to tackle but you know I see a lot of missed missed tackles when they're trying to to strip the ball. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you there, man. Well, and it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, look, if, you, if you're there to make the tackle, you know, number one guy, get in there, wrap up the next guy, get in there, you know, you pull at that thing like it's a lawnmower, right? But, but the primary guy, his job needs to be tackle, stop the play. And then, and then, you know, it, like if, if you have proper technique and you come in with a club as you're wrapping up, you know, with your hand or your, you, you put your helmet on the ball or, or what have you, like those are fortunate things. Um, but in general, you know, if I'm, unless, unless you've got, you know, some amazing talent out there or some monster, um, in general, like your, your job is to tackle them and to just stop them. Um, the next guy who comes in is, you know, I would encourage him to go ahead and take the ball away. And if people disagree, you know, that's fine. You know, no one has to agree. We don't have to have group think here. Um, but that's my opinion on, you know, if, on, on how defense is supposed to work. You know, like, like th there's a reason why turnover margin is farther down on the list versus the other defensive stats. Okay. Right. Scoring defense, stop the ball. Don't let them score. Okay. Then total defense. What's total defense? It's yards. Okay. Um, 
you you've got to you've got to make the tackle, prevent them from moving the ball down the field. Okay. Um, you know, I, I say yard points, which is kind of tug in cheek, and that's actually a reference to an older older show, which I won't go into here. Um, but yard points, as far as your defense is concerned, is the fifth most important stat. Total touchdowns, then passing touchdowns, then scoring offense. Those are top three, all offense. Then scoring defense, then total defense. Right. You have to stop the ball on defense. So that's why fundamental tackling, no big plays, right? You know, make the opponent's offense earn every fucking yard. Right. Do not take that for granted. Look, you get a turnover, great. But that is not your primary job as a defender is to get turnovers. Everyone likes right. it. It's really exciting. It's really fun in Notre Dame Stadium when our band starts doing the you know what I'm saying? Like, that's great. That's really fun. But no, I'd rather them go three and out, punt, and then we get the ball back. And then Tyree, yeah. you know, scores a touchdown, right? And and does his best Tim Brown impression. Right. Totally fine with that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I feel like I'm being really aggressive tonight. I don't know. We're talking about defense and tackling, right? Yeah. I'm I'm yes. trying to te- teach my toddler son proper form tackling of head up, wrap up, and drive your feet. There you go. So <laughs> start them too young. Can't start them too young. That's that's my thought. I got I got to work on the dock here to to warm up to uh, Tim playing. It's funny. We we have some friends. They have a, they have a kid who's like eight or nine or something. And he started playing like Pop Warner, you know, tackle football with, uh, you know, on a team or something. And, and and so, of course, you know, his dad was like a co coach or something on the team helping out or whatever. And and so so it's like a good like father son bonding thing, which I think is going to be my best uh, my best ally in the future here for something yeah. like that. You know, assuming assuming, you know, my kid wants to do that or even like I'm not going to put him out there if I don't think he's got the chops to do it. Like if I think he's going to be, you know, rocked like one of those, those, you know, videos you see on, on YouTube of, you know, poor little kids getting rocked. Like I'm, I don't, I don't want that to happen. I'd rather him be successful than whatever he does because he's not the biggest kid, but you know, he might have a growth spurt or might just be a, he might just have a little bit of, you know, Joe Schmidt in him and just, (laughs) Right. just be crazy <laughs> just be like ah you know <laughs> like and if that's the case then it's like look babe do you see that like he's gonna go sick him boy <laughs> yeah just have to watch his, his demeanor on the playground yeah that, that's it it's like okay maybe we should homeschool him i don't know <laughs> for the sake of the other children i don't know <laughs> and then it'll, then it'll then it'll be like unleashing the child on everyone else that'll have all this aggression. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh-huh. These are the conversations you have with about your toddler. Like, okay, where are we going next? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Absolutely. All right. Enough about my family. Uh, Lynch, anything else? Uh, and you, you think that uh, we need to discuss we've missed. Um, I appreciate all the, how we're bringing in strong, strong at the end of the show tonight on the defense this is fantastic absolutely no i i like i said i got on late um but yeah i think you know i'm sure you had it covered fairly well yeah just uh you know tackling and stopping the big play over the top i think it's going to be key absolutely now uh other other sidebar question since you're uh you're you're affiliated with the uh dos leprechauns universe uh, how are you going to spend that uh, bonus check we were promised today, right? 10,000 followers on Facebook. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, probably an extra game in South Bend. Yeah. Are we, are we <laughs> really getting money or is, 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 uh, is our, our fearless leader at Dos Leprechauns uh, just pulling our leg? Probably, yeah, yeah. I, I assume that's what's going on. Yeah. For now, for now, probably so. Yeah, I'm. I'm still waiting for business cards to show up. I think I'm just gonna have to vista print my own fucking business cards. Do you know how many times I see people? I was at the store today, and there was a dude with Notre Dame crap, and I'm just like, 
damn it. If I just had a business card, I could like straight up a conversation yeah. be like, hey, man, check us out. Here you go. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and being in SEC country, I see hardly any Notre Dame. Well, for you, it's even more important. It's like you've got to like, I, 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 I don't want to say like build a commune, but you definitely have to network and find find the Notre yeah. Dame people. I'm I'm fortunate to be here in Indiana, so at least I'm in the same flipping state. Right, yes. You know, I'm uh, I can claim Midwest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple really, really good friends of mine, they've been Notre Dame fans for a long time too. So we live in the same town, share the same Notre Dame football passion, so that's right. good. And then actually I've met some other people from, you know, three hours away at, at different, you know, high school events, whether it be basketball or football. Because I'm everywhere I go, it's it's Notre Dame gear. Because that's just about all my closet consists of. Yeah, I know it's it's pretty much everything I uh, I, I roll with as well. The um, you know another way to find uh, uh, Notre Dame fans is just you know go to Catholic Mass and then wear, wear a Notre Dame polo or something and just be like, hey, what's up? You know, and just kind of talk to the priest and then just kind of hang out and just like, Hey, yeah. There. And not that you should go to mass for a social thing. You should go there to actually right. know, develop your spirituality and your relationship with God. But, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. but we started the show tonight mentioning that today is a holy day of obligation. So if you're listening to this now, uh, all of you people who are listening to this on the 16th and you didn't go to mass and you are Catholic, you know what? look up when confession is because it was a holy day of obligation. All right, Catholics get, get with it, get with the program here. You know what, you know, better refocus your life. Okay. <laughs> Put the podcast down. All right. We, I, I, we went to the vigil yesterday. We went, I, I said, we're going to podcast. Um, it's Tuesday. It's usually a busier work week, right? For me, uh, Tuesdays in general, I'm like, let's go to the vigil. And even though we had a busy Monday, I'm like, like ah, do we want to go to the vigil? I'm like, and I'm like, no, let's get to go to the vigil. We'll go, you know, do our, our fulfillment. And, you know, we're planning our life around church, not the other way around. Okay. Right. It's, hey, one man's opinion. But, uh, yeah, that's me. This Agreed. Is, this is what we do here. All right, man. <laughs> We're uh, Jay, Kevin, Jason, if anyone, everyone just jump on. Last thoughts, if nothing else, just scream F Michigan and then hang up or go Irish. And like, here's the crazy piece. So so we did tonight's show. We've kind of gone through every statistical piece. Next week, we talk about Navy because it's Navy week next week. What the hell? Yeah. It just came on in a hurry. How the fuck did that happen so far? It doesn't even feel like... I'm not ready for football to start. Like, like I am because, I mean, I always miss Notre Dame football and I'm excited. Don't get me wrong. Right. But I'm also like, it, it's still August. Like, I feel like I'm, I've got to, like, you know, oversee my lawn or something right now still. I'm not even really, like, thinking about, like, football. Like, yes, we're doing this podcast and I'm drinking drinking the scotch right and we're doing all that happiness but it's like how is it football season already like this is nuts like jason does does notre dame have the first game like in all of college football i think well yeah probably i remember so. reading that but i never went and actually did the research like to like the schedule like it's usually like florida atlantic versus you know, Citadel or, you know, something weird like that. Right. Or, or some other big game, like the, like the one, they always have that like big kickoff game that's in Georgia or something. It's always like a Wednesday night game, right? Yeah. yeah. It could very well be because I know it, it's what 1230 centrals when it starts. Gosh, so. I, you know, I was on, on, you know, I've got, uh, I got the internet here. Let's just verify this. Uh, all right, ND Nation, we're gonna we're gonna roll with you. Um, ND Nation is telling me that it's uh two thirty Eastern, one thirty right. Central. Yeah, which is okay. crazy because I th I'm pretty sure that's a that's a late game. That's if let's yep. see if Ireland is five six hours seven thirty eight thirty. That's a night game over there in in uh, in Ireland. So because yeah, the last one they played was. God, it started like at eight in the morning. Here. It was early. Yeah. I remember watching it like nine, 10 in the morning. I agree. I remember in our apartment, 
um, in 2012. And I remember, I remember that season very well. Um, and I remember watching that game, um, in the morning, um, uh, and absolutely loving it. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was way early. I was having coffee and watching Notre Dame football instead. It was awesome. Like, I'm pretty sure I, it, for me, it was coffee. Like we had a, like a big breakfast and then, you know, we had coffee and then we were like spiking it with Jameson and maybe a little bit of Bailey's or whatever. And then, like, like that was the game, like did not drink beer at all. Cause it's like, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Like it just doesn't sound good with, with an omelet. Yeah. 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 Beer and a bacon, egg and cheese biscuit. Doesn't sound- <laughs> yeah. No, but coffee. Now we're talking. Yes. All right. So let's see here. Um, we may or may not. I still have to have to grease some wheels here. There, there's. Um, we will of course next week this time do our Navy pregame. Now we will not be breaking down triple option film because we don't actually know if that's what Navy is going to do now that they have a they kind of cleaned house at the end of last year. Yes, uh, and I think. Hey, maybe they're using some kind of two quarterback system. Now, I don't know if it's two quarterbacks on the field at the same time. That's chaos. Yeah, what the issue is going to be there. But I did, it was a headline on one of the pages I was scrolling through social media. Yeah. So, um, so more to come on Navy. We'll do our research on, uh, scouting the Naval Academy, or maybe they're just going, uh, special ops covert on us. And uh, gonna try to catch the Irish by surprise. We don't know yet, but we'll we'll save that analysis for this time next week on the podcast version, which you can find on on well, we're on Twitter Live, Twitter Space, and then Spotify, iTunes, and all these other uh, your normal podcast places. This is the Fighting Irish Faithful show. Powered by Dos Leprechauns Media. Still waiting for the check to clear, right, Jason? <laughs> yes. But we do this because we love Notre Dame, and uh, honestly, it's it's a good group of people to be associated with, and and um, happy happy to contribute to the Los, Dos Leprechauns universe. But I did have to tell ND Nation that the Fighting Irish Faithful shows link that they used because because ND Nation has actually linked me for for over two years. Um, right on my shows and I don't even really have to like tell them, but I did have to reach out to them uh, this year and say, Hey, we've officially moved over here to the Dos Leprechauns YouTube channel. So if you want to listen to this or put it on YouTube or whatever, um, it's on the Dos Leprechauns YouTube channel. Yeah. New outlet. New outlet. It is a new outlet. Well, I mean, they're the, they're the mothership. Now they're not directly paying the bills here, but, uh, (laughs) <laughs> right, right. How, how many how many more uh more jabs can we give to to our uh our, our fearless leader i don't know but... yeah not listening so i feel it's free game that's right well yeah yeah some sort of like maybe maybe he'll like you know print off the whole transcript of the show and and go through it line by line with a highlighter and yeah I, I, I can picture him with like one of those like green like banker's visors you know and and what what's that thing on the arm it's it's like it's like an armband like you see like like i imagine like a like a bookie at like a horse race like was it like a man garter like an arm garter you know what i'm talking about right <laughs> i can see although <laughs> can you imagine yeah could you I'll imagine to... hendrix with one of those on <laughs> i'll have to work up an edit with hendrix in a bookie outfit <laughs> Please do that. You know, Photoshop his face with, with a man garter on. <laughs> yeah. And a, and a green visor. A clear green visor. Yes, yes. The clear front. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, All right. All right. Well, Mr. Lynch, thank you for jumping on and uh, your contribu- contributions tonight. Kevin Davis, any last thoughts before we sayonara out of here for the week? Only to come back ready for to defeat Navy. If not, Kevin, have a good night. And uh, Kevin Davis, we we hope you're still coaching football. Uh, we want to uh, stay up to up to uh, up to date on how the team is doing. If you are still coaching, if not, no big deal. Uh, let's see here. Any last thoughts? I I don't think so. We've gone very stat heavy tonight. We've talked about the team. You know, we 
here's the thing. We don't really know what is in store this season. You know, we we try to use data and analytics, but there may, may be someone we have not mentioned or only mentioned their name once or twice tonight. And, um, you know, they may be very impactful on either offense and or defense. We don't know. Um, but if that's the case, you know, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna bring it. Um, and if not, you know, (coughs) and, and we, we hit the nail on the head that price is, is the key and him and, Estime are going to be the the one two punch, and we'll hear Estime doing his dance, you know, green jersey, whatever thing. Um, um, and Price will have hear the Price is Right thing. You know, it's uh, it's all good. It's all good. Oh yes. So. All right. Well, this seems fitting since uh, today is the assumption of Our Lady. Figure we go out with something a little more chill, honoring uh, Notre Dame, Our Lady, and the Mother of Christ, Christ our Savior. I think I appreciate. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is the Fighting Irish Faithful Show, powered by Dos Leprechauns Media, Season Four, Episode Five, Volume Ninety One very happy uh if you've stayed with us for the hour and a half that this show has been going on um thank you really appreciate everyone's loyalty and if you're new you can expect this similar analysis now it's the beginning of the season it's a little light on the contributors but i guarantee you we will do some post-game shows and once we hit the season and we start moving in our stride we'll start uh start doing stuff here thank you everyone Have a good night. Go Irish, and we'll see you one more show before the season begins.